All right, thank you, Karen. And it's a pleasure to be here today. So why don't we kick off with a quick poll so that we kind of get to know each other a little bit. All right, so, okay, we have a good mix. It's a mix of researchers, students, and entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for taking the poll. All right, so let's get started with problem solution fit. So let's talk about why should I care about problem solution fit to begin with. And I would like to start with two famous quotes. One is by Henry Ford that said, if I had asked people what they want, they would have said a faster horse. And Steve Jobs said, it is not your customer's job to know what they want. And often most people think, look at these quotes and they think, oh, I don't really need to ask my customer because look, Henry Ford and Steve Jobs didn't feel the need to ask their customer. And we will come back to these quotes a little later in the process. Uh, but I would like to point out that even though these quotes sound like they are not engaging with the customer, I think these quotes themselves tell you a lot about what they are saying. So the first one, if I had asked people what they want, they would have said a faster horse. Um, the, the customer is actually telling you what they want right there. They're telling you that they want to go faster and the current methodology that they have is not fast enough, which in this case was a horse. So if they could get something that was a faster horse, they would be willing to buy that. And in, in case of Steve Jobs, it is not your customer's job to know what they want. What Steve is referring here to is, it's not your customer's job to design the product, but your customer can tell you what problem they have. They are not the ones who are actually going to design the product. So that is going to be your responsibility. It's going to be something that you will do based on what you learn from the customer's needs. So let's talk about some current you know, quotes as a uh, problem solution fit has become more uh, relevant and lean startups have become more um, uh, predominant in our uh, world today. Um, Ash Moria, who is a founder of Lean Startup said, the biggest risk for startups is to build something that no one wants. And Dave from 500 Startups says, customers don't care about your solutions, they care about your problems. And so it is these two things that we are really going to focus on today, is how do you build something that people want to buy and how do you build something that is actually solving a problem? All right, so let's, uh, so this, this is one of my favorite infographics. Uh, CBI Insights does this every year. They send out the top, they actually do top 20 reasons why startups fail and they send this out every year. And uh, I, I picked the top 10 reasons of the top 20 that they have listed. And almost invariably, every single year, no market need is the number one reason why startups fail. And it typically accounts for 40 to 50% of the reason why startups fail. And then the other one that I want to highlight is product mis mistimed. And I, I consider the no market need and the product mistimed as both issues related to a problem solution fit. It's startups that have not identified a problem solution fit uh, who actually fail for these reasons. Uh, the other ones that I have highlighted become important further down in the startup journey. And they are also aligned with the problem solution fit, but more downstream in a startup's journey rather than early stage when you're actually trying to identify with what is the problem that the customer is facing and why do you need to solve it? So what, what should we be thinking about when we're thinking about problem solution fit, right? The first thing that we should be thinking about is, is it required? as in do customers need this? 
Second is, is it viable? Will they pay for it? And third is, is it feasible? Can I build it? Often what happens is we start backwards. We start with, is it feasible? We start with building something and trying to feel, say, oh, well, I have this really cool widget. Now let me go out and share it with people and see if they want to buy it. And that approach kind of worked really well in the manufacturing era where we had this mindset of if you build it, they will come. Uh, and that uh, given, given the market dynamics of that time, that seemed a very relevant approach. But as we are in industry 4.0 now, where the customer is very enlightened, where products are not necessarily uh, scant or what we have to develop is in a very crowded market space, we have to come up with new things because the market already has a lot of solutions. So when you're trying to come up with new things in a market that has existing solutions, you need to make sure that you're solving a real problem. If we go back to the time of Henry Ford, where the solution was a horse and he was building a car, that is, in that phase, if, if we build it, they will buy, seems extremely relevant. But in today's market space, where we, we have not a, one type of car, we have choices on the different types of cars, right? We have the regular engine cars, we have the hybrid cars, we have the electric cars, the people working on self-driving cars. So now in this space where there are so many different products available, what problem am I going to solve if I build a new car or a new mode of transportation for that matter? So our approach to problems, to, uh, our approach has change to innovation to new product development mainly because the market dynamics have changed over the years and in today's market it is important to have a problem solution fit and not necessarily adopt the mentality of if we build it they will come so i will walk you through five different steps of how we can establish problem solution fit if we are innovating, if we are uh, researchers, or if we are startups, what, what do we need to do in order to develop problem solution fit? So the first step is identifying what is the problem, right? And in order to talk about this, I'll talk about uh, Ted Levitt, uh, who's a professor, uh, whose most famous quote is, your customer wants a quarter inch hole not a quarter inch drill bit. So your customers typically buy products to do a job. They are trying to do something, which is why they're going to buy a, buy a product. So if a customer wants to hang up a frame, they want a quarter inch hole. They do not care how they create that hole. It could be a quarter inch drill bit, it could be a hammer and a nail crude. It could be anything that actually works that would allow them to create the hope. So we really need to focus on understanding what is the problem that the customer is trying to solve? What is the job that the customer is trying to do? Because unless and until we have an understanding of that, we will not be able to develop a solution that the customer wants to buy, right? And the only way to do it is to talk to your customers. Um, there are various ways of trying to get insights, trying to identify the problem. The most common one is interviews. If any of you are familiar with the NSF i program, uh, if you go through the program, they will ask you to do 100 customer interviews. Not 10, not 20, 100. And you might think, that's a lot, and probably there are a lot, but I will, uh, uh, in my next sl slide, we will talk about why they will ask you to do 100 customer interviews. The more people you talk to, the better will be your problem definition. 
uh, the better you will really understand the needs of the customer. Uh, the other few ways of identifying a problem is just merely observation. Go to a workplace and observe and see what they're doing and find where the inefficiencies are. Uh, so for example, it's very common when you're developing medical products to go watch a doctor, especially surgical products. I myself have gone and spent, uh, spent a day in a surgical suite watching doctors uh, perform surgeries and actually trying to identify areas where there is an actual need where uh, we can develop products to help solve their needs. Uh, another methodology is uh, diary logging. So this is where you're asking your potential customer to actually write down what they are doing. And uh, then you take that diary and you find uh, points of inefficiency that they are experiencing, or they themselves in the process of writing might express areas of frustration. So we did this uh, process with one of the clients that we had. It was a cosmetics client, and they wanted to uh, re uh, understand what products they needed to introduce into the market. And so we did uh, this methodology with them where we recruited a few uh, potential customers, and we asked them to just keep a diary where they recorded uh, what they did from morning to evening around their skincare and uh, hair care regime, right? Like what shampoo did they use? Like what time, what did they do as soon as they got up? How, you know, what, how, what did they do for their skincare? What did they do for their hair care throughout the day, fr starting from the morning and going to bed at night? And then we can use the insights that they have captured uh, to try and understand, you know, what is their routine like? Where can we make things better? Where are the inefficiencies, et cetera? And the last one is customer journey mapping, where you actually sit down. It's similar to diary login, but instead of the customer sitting down and writing things, you sit down and you basically talk to the customer, have them talk you through their day, and you map out, now in, not necessarily the day, but their journey. So for this cosmetics client, a day was sufficient because we wanted to understand their routine from morning to night. So we mapped out the customer journey from morning to night and then really had conversations along those lines to try and understand where the customer needed more support and you know where we could actually build products to help them. If it was a different product which required a longer term journey, say um, a, a product around healthcare or you know, a patient going in to see a doctor, that customer journey mapping would, would be different than this particular customer journey mapping because then we would start with what is a customer, uh, what is the patient doing to get ready for the doctor's visit? What do they do when they actually get to the doctor's office? How long do they have to wait in the doctor's office? What are they doing during that waiting time? What do they do when they actually visit the doctor? And then what do they do after the doctor's visit? So each customer journey mapping would be different depending upon what product or what area that you are working in. Um, some, some customer journey mapping can be a day, some customer journey mapping can go on for a few weeks or even months. As if you're talking about uh, patients that are dealing with chronic healthcare problems, we might have to do a customer journey mapping to them that probably extends around months. So uh, there, there are different ways of engaging with your customers, but the key is to really understand where are the inefficiencies and what is the problem that we are solving? And I will quote Steve Blank in this, where we are very comfortable doing things from our computers. You know, it's, it's our safe space to build stuff first or research first, etc. But the only way we will actually learn what the problem is, is if we get out of the building and talk to our customers, because that is where the, act, the real information lies and where is the problem. 
So the next point that we want to talk about is who is your customer? And you would think this order might be reversed. Like, should I not know who my customer is first before I start talking to them? So let me explain that to you. So when I talk about who is your customer, let's say you have a potential idea around, maybe you have decided, maybe you have noticed that right now there is a significant inefficiency around elder home care. Right, so there are a lot of elderly people who are staying at home, maybe alone, and there are not a lot of resources to take care of them or to support them. And maybe that's an area that you're interested in exploring further. When you start talking to your customers early on, often what you're going to do is to try and find most any elderly person and start having a conversation with them, right? You're starting to understand them, who they are and what kind of problems they're facing. After you have a few interviews, you will start realizing that not all elderly people have the same problems. And so automatically the population starts segmenting itself into different areas. Those segments can be um, based on a variety of factors, but the segmentation can happen maybe if you're talking about the elderly population. Let's say we can start segmenting people based on whether they are healthy or whether they have any chronic conditions, whether they are mobile or whether they're immobile, whether they live by themselves or whether they live with their children. Uh, do they, uh, are, they, are they tech friendly? Are they using any tech devices or are they very old school, right? So there are a lot of different ways of segmenting customers. And you realize as you talk to them that clear segments will start forming. And then you have to understand which of these segments is the segment that I really want to work with because you can't help everybody at the same time. That's, that's the mistake that a lot of startups make at the very beginning. Yes, when you have a product or when you have an idea, there is a possibility that you will be able to impact multiple segments. But if you try and be everything to everyone at the get-go, you're going to surely fail. So who is your customer is very, very important upfront because you need to identify one segment, what is the problem in that segment, and how are you going to solve that problem? You start with one problem. You develop a product to solve that problem. And then you will be able to expand into other segments eventually. But if you try, if you identify five, five problems in five different, different customer segments and you try to solve them all at the same time, you will be extremely diluted in your effort. Your product will not meet the specifications of any one customer segment properly and you will fit. And so who is your customer? It's very, very important to start knowing this very early in the process as to which customer segment are you actually targeting. There, there are two ways of doing customer segmentation, qualitative and quantitative. We hear a lot of things around quantitative customer segmentation. This is basically geographic segmentation, demographic segmentation, behavioral segmentation, or predictive segmentation. So geographic is simple, right? Where are you based? And uh, do I want to work with customers that are on um, in the United States, or do I want to work with customers that are in Asia? And yeah, depending upon the need, uh, geography, the needs will be different. Demographic, age, sex, uh, education, family, et cetera. Uh, behavioral, what are their behaviors? So what are their buying behaviors? And predictive, they bought this and they bought uh, X and they will buy Y with it. So based on that predictive behavior, we can make these recommendations. Now with data analytics and AI, there is more and more and more information around quantitative. And it is excellent information that we should absolutely have and leverage. 
But in the early phases, when you are actually trying to do your uh, problem solution fit, you want to do your research qualitatively. As in, you want to go out, you want to talk to people, you want to develop the different personas, and which I talked about as segments, right? So the different personas fall under different segments. And then pick the one persona or segment that you want to build out uh, your solution for. Once you are further down in your research process, you will use the quantitative tools downstream. You will absolutely use the quantitative tools downstream, but early on in the process, you want to focus on qualitative interviews and not just go into quantitative. It's easy to do the quantitative, right? We can buy a report from somewhere or we can hear, uh, hire a data analytics consultant who will do the work for us and give us a report that we just have to read. That will not give you the information that you want at the early stage of your startup or your product development process. And so while you might get insights from quantitative, they likely will not provide you the right insights to help you identify the right problem and the right customer segment. And often uh, larger companies actually are very guilty of doing this, right? Buying reports and making decisions based on that and spending few million and a few uh, and a couple of years in development and discovery only to find out once they actually have a product that the customer that they were targeting is actually not interested in buying their product. So invest a little time and energy early on in your qualitative research, because that is what will really help you identify the right problem for the right market. The next question you wanna ask then after you've done this is how are they currently solving the problem? So I will go back to Henry Ford's quote, which is if I would have asked my customers what they want, they would have said a faster horse. So the customers were already solving their problem, right? They were using a horse to get to places. Maybe they were not getting there as fast as possible, but they were still getting there. So Henry Ford's competition was a horse. Now that might sound funny, but often in, uh, and that is what he had to compete against. He had to compete, uh, convince people that they had to buy his car, which would be faster than a horse. And that required a lot of convincing. That was not an easy uh, sell initially for people who were used to riding horses and who had to now operate this heavy machinery to get from one point to the other. And it was probably an expensive piece of machinery as well. So uh, knowing your competition is very, very, very important because your customer is always figuring out a way to solve their problem. They have found a way to solve their problem one way or another, right? Either they're using existing products, which means that there is competition, uh, there is another company that is making something similar that is available in the market. Uh, the customer may be using it, they may not be happy about with it because it probably doesn't have all the functionalities that they want, but they're using that product. Uh, sometimes they may not find one product that can do what they want. So they might be combining two or three different products to solve their problem. Classic example is uh, using shampoo and conditioner as two separate bottles, right? Companies have tried to combine shampoo and conditioner in one, and that has not been a very successful product because that ratio that people need varies. People with, uh, uh, you know, so, thin straight hair need less conditioning, more volume, and people with hair like mine, which is thick and curly, need higher conditioning. And so uh, that product combination, even though that is available or companies have tried to put it into the market has not been successful and nobody has gotten that combination right yet. 
And so customers are still using two different products because the, they would love to have one product, right? A shampoo, conditioner in one is a product that I would love to have. But unless and until I find a product that satisfies my needs, I will com use, com continue to combine two or three different products to achieve the results that I want. And lastly, if there's nothing available in the market, they might just jury rig a solution, right? So they might take existing parts and pieces, put them together and figure out a way to make it work. This is very, this is surprisingly common in the medical field, actually. So I was working with a company uh, and we were developing pediatric products. And in the pediatric universe, it is very common for doctors to jury rig adult products for pediatric applications because come, uh, pediatrics is a small market. And so companies don't tend to actually invest in research and development for pediatric products because the return on investment is low. And uh, so doctors don't have a choice. They will take a catheter for an adult and bend it or shape it or modify it in a way that it, they can use it in a pediatric patient. It is not optimum and they would definitely want one that is designed for pediatrics. But since there is nothing available in the market to address that need, they are jury rigging a solution. So your customers are always have all figured out how to solve their problem. Now, if you tell me that, oh, my product is so unique that my customers currently are not solving it anyway, I would say that in that case, if your customer is not trying to solve that problem, maybe that problem is not strong enough. And if that problem is not a strong enough problem, they will not pay money to buy your product, right? So we have to be very, very careful about this where often we get so, uh, uh, fall so much in love with our creations that we say, oh, I have no competition or what I'm making is so unique, no one else has done it before. You might be right, yes, your product might be very unique and something like that may not exist on the market, but it still has to solve a problem. It still has to solve a problem that is existing in the marketplace. Because if it is not solving a problem that is existing in the marketplace, no one will buy it. So if you remember the top 10 reasons why startups failed, there was one that said product was mistimed. There are many products that have failed because they were great products, but the market was not ready for it, right? So um, there are uh, the, the example of uh, BlackBerry very early on trying to come up with a smartphone is a good example of something like that, where they were trying to build something, but the market was not ready for it. Or maybe you're building something, but it requires resources that, the, that we currently do not have to make that product a reality. Artificial intelligence is a great example of that. Artificial intelligence has been in R&D since the 1960s. We are seeing a massive boom now of artificial intelligence. And the only reason we are seeing a massive boom now for artificial intelligence is because the data required to make artificial intelligence a reality is becoming available to us today. So even though people started working on AI in the 1960s, it could not have been a successful company at that time because the resources required to make AI a reality were not available. And so are we really solving a problem that is existing? Do we, can we build a solution that we can solve that problem? So the product mistime in my mind is very much an issue with a uh, 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 misaligned problem solution fit. And then, and then let's talk about your solution. So what is your solution and how does it solve the problem? So let's talk about two examples here. Uh, you're probably all familiar with the company OXO, which uh, develops uh, better grip, good grip products 
Uh, and OXO came about because the founder basically saw his wife struggling with a peeler without the uh, rubber grip and she had arthritis and she was in a lot of pain trying to use that peeler. And so she asked him to develop something that would help her and that's how the OXO brand came about. OXO is not a disruptive innovation in any way. They have not redesigned kitchen tools. They have not made brand new kitchen tools that will change how you cook. All that they have done is taken existing kitchen tools and made them more user-friendly. So even when they did this, even though the entrepreneur was coaxed into doing this with his wife expressing a problem, they didn't just go out and start making it. They did a lot of research associated with it. They talked to the Arthritis Foundation. They talked to other foundations where, that were supporting people with disabilities and really figured out the needs of the people so that they could design products that people wanted. And but after talking to all those people, they realized, yes, this is definitely a problem. And if we design products to help solve this problem, people will buy it. The other company that we talk about is Tesla. Tesla is more on the disruptive end, right? It is still a car, but it is disrupting the oil and gas industry by developing um, electric cars. And uh, Tesla is addressing, the market need that Tesla is addressing is people's desire to be environmentally friendly. The car is no different from a regular car, but the reason why people will buy a Tesla is because they care about climate change, they care about global warming, and they want to make sure that the world is, uh, is safer for us in the future and for future generations. So the need that Tesla is addressing is not the need of commuting. The need that Tesla is addressing is the need for uh, uh, addressing the problem of climate change that people care about. And that is, and here the geography part becomes very important. If Tesla had introduced its, its car in Ohio, where I am, it probably wouldn't have been very successful. But being introducing Tesla in California, where people are really passionate about this issue, uh, helped because it got that initial traction in a geography where people were accepting and were really demanding a solution. And once it got acceptance in California, it started moving into other geographies and started gaining acceptance. So with both of these examples, you'd see that the solution is uh, addressing a problem, but the problem in both cases is very different. And so really, really understanding that problem becomes key to trying to under define the solution and then who is, which is the right target segment for you to introduce your solution to? Who is your first adopter who will actually buy your product? And then the last piece of this is how are you unique? What is your unique value proposition? So there, as we talked about, your customer has needs and wants. Your competition has products that are trying to solve those needs. And then you are trying to develop products that is trying to solve your customer's needs. And where, where you want to be is in this space of where you are trying, you are solving something that your customer wants that is currently not being solved by your competition. And this, this piece becomes very, very important, right? Because often when you go out and pitch something, they say, oh, why, why should I buy this? There's already this company that is doing this. How are you any different? For all the entrepreneurs in the house, I'm sure you're very, very familiar with this question. 
with VCs, with angels, with any, any investor that you go to, or even any customer that you go to, you'll get asked that question. Why should I buy this when I already have this existing product? And unless and until you can convince them that what I am offering really is unique and different from what the competition has, and it's going to solve the customer's problem either better, faster, or cheaper, you're not going to be able to get a lot of traction in the market space. So um, those are my five tips for establishing a product problem solution fit. Um, as we talked about, I, I went over how do you define your problem by really, really talking to customers understanding who, which customer segment you wish to go after, understanding how is the customer currently solving their problem, then really thinking about what is your solution and what specific problem is that solution solving. And then lastly, how are you unique? How are you different from the competition that will allow you to really differentiate yourself in the market? So with that, I will open up for questions if you have any. Um, and um, it was a pleasure being here with you today. Thank you, Dr. Kapadia. Uh, do we you. have any questions from the audience? I'd like to take those first before I take um, some of the emailed questions that came in. Um, so please feel free to either unmute your mics and engage directly. Um, but here is one to kick it off. So what if I'm already a researcher and I already have patents in place? So can I still use this problem solution fit that, you know, you're referring to? Absolutely. Yes, that's a great question. So, yes, you can still use the problem solution fit that, you're, uh, that uh, we talked about um, because even though you might have a patent in place, even though you might have a technology in place, you still need to really identify what problem are you going to solve for your customer. So, and you still need to identify what customer segment are you targeting. And then you need to decide what features do you need in your product to actually solve that problem. Right, so you might maybe have a patent that covers a lot of different things, or you might have a product that might have uh, uh, addressed multiple needs. But if those needs are not really a problem with the customer, you really need to figure out what features do you actually want in the final product that will help solve the customer's problems. Uh, it's also about uh, really thinking about making sure you're not gold plating stuff, right? As researchers, we get really uh, uh, attached to our technologies and we want to keep making it better and better and better because that is very cool to us. But if the customer does not need that, all that you're doing by keeping on trying to make it better is jacking up the price of the product without really understanding if that is a problem that the customer needs to solve. And if that is something, if that better in your mind is actually a better for in the customer's mind, right? Absolutely. Now, can you suggest, I'm gonna go talk to a hundred customers. Can you suggest some tools that, um, you know, uh, people can use? Um, yes, I like uh, The Lean Canvas by Ash Moria. His book, The Lean St uh, Startup, is one of the books that I use. And so The Lean Canvas that he recommends in that, uh, or The Lean Canvas that he's developed, I think is a really good canvas for early stage problem solution fit. Uh, once you get more mature, there are other tools. I would transition from the Lean Canvas to the Business Model Canvas once you have established your problem solution fit and then go on from there. But the Lean Canvas is a really great starting point for doing. 